So uh, thank you for the uh, invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk about work that I did jointly with Ludmila Karanova. It's about arithmetic and algebraic hyperbolicity. And the aim of my talk is to provide evidence, uh, modest evidence, for the conjectures of Lang that we've already seen. So they're also due to Demai. Green Griffiths, and Lang. All right, so I actually want to start with explaining uh, the conjecture of Lang. There are several versions of it, and this is the most optimistic and also slightly controversial one. And to uh, explain it, I'll introduce what I would like to call groupless varieties. So these are varieties which are very far from being algebraic groups. So let me start with a definition. A variety, x over a field k, and little k will always be algebraically closed. So k is an algebraically closed field. And it will always be of characteristic 0. So for me, this means q bar or the complex numbers. That's basically all that matters today. And a variety x over k is groupless over k if every morphism in the category of varieties over k from an algebraic group to x is constant. So this is a definition. Every morphism from a finite type group scheme which is connected uh, to x is constant. And the first example of a non-groupless variety is the projective line. So P1 is not groupless. It contains a group, namely A1, also GM. And in fact, groupless varieties, uh, when they're projective, they don't admit any maps from P1, so they have no rational curves. And you can use this to see, for instance, that in dimension one, let's stick the projective. This is the same as being of genus at least two. This is an exercise with Jacobians. So groupless for curves is the same as uh, being hyperbolic. And what I want to say now is that it seems like a lot to test on maps from algebraic groups, but actually you can content yourself to uh, testing on maps from abelian varieties when x is projective. So this is a small remark as well. If x is projective, <coughs> then being groupless is the same as admitting no maps from an abelian variety. So I want to say two things about groupless varieties, and then I'll talk about the conjecture of Lang. The first thing I want to say was this. The second thing is, what about surfaces? What, what, are, what are groupless surfaces? So groupless surfaces are always of general type. So if the dimension of x is at most 2, then uh, being groupless is the same as being uh, as having the, uh, the property that every subvariety is of general type. Want to say dimension or uh, at most two, if dimension of x is at most two. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> the 
This is a uh, exercise with uh, birational geometry. You need first to uh, realize that the Kodera dimension of a resolution is uh, non-negative. Then you need something about K3 surfaces to exclude them. And then uh, something about Kodera dimension one, always admitting an elliptic vibration, so definitely not groupless. And then you're in Kodera dimension two. We don't know because, uh, precisely because of the corresponding fact for K3 surfaces. You need something about Calabi-Yau threefolds, which is not known. Namely, that they have maps from abelian surfaces or rational curves. <coughs> so. So another class of examples of uh, groupless varieties are provided by Brody hyperbolic varieties. In fact, if I take a variety over the complex numbers, then it is Brody hyperbolic if and only if it has no entire curves but it's in fact equivalent to being analytically groupless, meaning for every algebraic group over C, for any finite type group scheme which is connected over C, any analytic map, any holomorphic map in the category of complex analytic spaces is constant. So once you prove this, it's kind of obvious that Brody hyperbolic varieties are groupless. And the controversial conjecture I mentioned is that the converse holds, that the uh, presence of an algebraic group is the only obstruction to the presence of an entire curve. Oh, this is for projective varieties. If X is Brody, then it is groupless. And the conjecture is the statement that this is in fact an equivalence. The other way around. So this conjecture is known, for instance, in dimension one by what's written there. But it's also known, for instance, if X is, uh, can be embedded into an abelian variety. That's the theorem of Bloch, Uchiai, and Kawamata. So this is known if X can be embedded, singular or not, so smooth or not, it's not important, known if X can be embedded uh, into an abelian variety. It is also known, as we've seen, for general hypersurfaces of high enough degree in projective space. So I actually want to talk about the arithmetic uh, analog of this conjecture. So I have to define what it means to be arithmetically hyperbolic. And this is equivalent conjecturally to being Brody hyperbolic for projective varieties over C. So let me just give you the definition and then say in words what, what you should think about. So a variety. X over K <coughs> is arithmetically hyperbolic over K if it has only finally many integral points. So to speak about integral points, that doesn't make any sense unless you choose equations. 
So the definition looks a bit uh, formal, but you have to say for every finely generated subring, of your field K, so think of Z itself, or think of any number ring, or think of Z adjoint pi and maybe e to the power two, if K is uh, C. For every model for X, what do I mean by a model? I just mean a finite type scheme over A, which is isomorphic to X over K. So this means a choice of equations defining x over a. Once you've made these choices, you can talk about a-valued points on the model, and the statement then becomes the set of a-valued points, or just sections of your scheme, is finite. So the first thing I want to tell you is that arithmetically hyperbolic varieties are always groupless. And this And this can be proven using the potential density of rational points on abelian varieties over finely generated fields of characteristic zero due to Hasachenko. So this is essentially due to Hasachenko. And the conjecture is again that the grouplessness is enough to force the arithmetic hyperbolicity. So the conjecture of Lang is that for a projective variety over K, <coughs> the converse of this implication also holds. So the conjecture is that a groupless projective variety is also arithmetically hyperbolic. So if x is projective, then and k is q bar, yeah. then every point valued in the number field is in fact a point valued in spec OK. Uh -huh. There's no uh, difference. Okay. So integral points is the same as rational points if k is q bar and x is projective. It's the same. Yeah. All right. So what do we know about this conjecture? We know that this conjecture holds when the dimension of x is 1, but now it's actually a very deep theorem of faultings. And stated like this, it was only proven in 1985, after his 1983 paper on the Mordell conjecture. So this is the statement that if x is a curve, then it is groupless if and only if it is arithmetically hyperbolic. And later, about 10 years later, he proved that this is also true for closed subvarieties of abelian varieties. So he also proved in 1992 that if X is a closed subvariety of an abelian variety, then the grouplessness of this variety is equivalent 
to being arithmetically hyperbolic. So apart from the f one other theorem about Shimura varieties of abelian type, this is about everything we know about arithmetically hyperbolic varieties that are projective. So I'm, I'm confused. What's missing if we assume Mordell? What is, why is what's missing? Just this implies Mordell. Yeah, this thing. What, what's the difference? The difference is uh, that Mordell is only over Q bar. Right, so the statement is that an arithmetically hyperbolic variety, sorry, a genus of these two curve over Q bar, which is smooth and projective, is arithmetically hyperbolic over Q bar. And that's proven in, in his 1983 paper, and then later he proved it over any algebraic closed field of characteristic zero, which is slightly more difficult because there are more fields to prove the finiteness of. <laughs> So this theorem is the analog of Kawamata Uchiai block in the analytic setting. So let me start with some evidence, which is what I want to talk about. So if I want to give evidence for this conjecture, I look at properties of hyperbolic varieties. So I, for instance, could start with a theorem of Kobayashi and Brody, and also Kaup, Suzuki, and Urata were aware of this. It's the fact that if you take a Brody hyperbolic projective variety, then it has only finitely many symmetries. So if X is a projective Brody hyperbolic variety, then the symmetry group is finite. So it has only finitely many automorphisms. And the way you prove this is you need to first decide how you're going to prove the finiteness of this set. So you need some criterion. And the criterion is that this set is the set of points on some locally finite type group scheme, say. And you want to show that it's zero dimensional, so that automorphisms are rigid. And you want to show that it's bounded, so that it's in fact a finite type uh, variety. And this is how you do it. If you have a Brody hyperbolic projective variety, then Brody showed that this is Kobayashi hyperbolic. And then you use the metric, the Kobayashi metric, to show that the space of automorphisms is compact. So this is a consequence of Arcela Ascoli's theorem. So the space of, it's a projective scheme if you want. And then at the same time, you say, oh, but it is actually groupless. And this means that the identity component of the automorphism scheme, being an algebraic group, has to be trivial as it acts faithfully. This always implies that the identity component of this group scheme is trivial. So now you have a compact, discrete set, and thus it is finite. So how would you do, how would I now uh, proceed? I would be interested in saying, okay, what if I replace the word Brody hyperbolic by arithmetically hyperbolic? If I believe the conjectures of Lang, then the same statement should be true. So the, main, the first main result is that indeed, if you take a projective variety, which is arithmetically hyperbolic over any algebraic closed field of characteristic zero, then its symmetry group is finite. <laughs> so
So now I would like to decide again, how am I gonna do that? Can I maybe use a similar argument? And we're gonna see that this is not how we're gonna do it. We're gonna use facts from dynamical systems in arithmetic geometry. So the proof that I'm going to explain, let's give you the idea. Can be uh, summarized in three steps. So it's just gonna be three steps. And the first step is to agree that if you take a point on this arithmetically hyperbolic variety and you take an automorphism of it, then the orbit of this point is finite. And this actually has nothing to do with sigma being automorphism, it's for any endomorphism. If P is a k-valued point on X and sigma is an automorphism, then the forward orbit of this point is finite. This is basically because if you choose this, if you have this point and you descend everything to a finely generated subring, you choose a model over this finely generated subring, and you descend the morphism, and now the orbit is actually a subset of your A-valued points, so it's finite. The second step is to apply a theorem of Katya Amerik, which is non-trivial when K is countable only, which is the statement that if you take a surjective endomorphism of any variety, and it has the property that every point has a finite orbit, then this surjective endomorphism is actually an automorphism of finite order. So it's a torsion automorphism. This is a theorem of Katya Amerik. So what is then the conclusion is that every automorphism is torsion. So the automorphism group of X is a torsion group. And the final ingredient is uh, that if you have a projective variety, any projective variety over an algebraic closed field of characteristic zero, whose automorphism group is torsion, then this automorphism group is finite. So if this is torsion, then of course, Sorry, if it's finite, then of course it is torsion, and the statement is that the converse is true as well. So, I won't explain the proof of this, uh, because I want to move on to other aspects of the Lang conjecture. So I want to talk about algebraic hypervelocity in the sense of Demai, as we saw in Eric's talk. So if I take any projective variety, 
over k, then this is algebraically hyperbolic. over k, if for some or any ample line bundle, there is some constant alpha, which only depends on x and l, such that for every curve, over k, the degree of a morphism from C to X is bounded in terms of this constant times the genus of the curve. So that's the definition. It's, you could think of this as the function field analog of arithmetic hyperbolicity. But I'd like to stress that this is a very strong condition of boundedness. You're not asking a bound which depends on the curve. You're asking for a bound which only depends on the genus of the curve. And not only the genus, you want it to be linear in the genus. So what does this have to do with hyperbolicity? So Demaye proved that algebraically hyperbolic projective varieties are groupless. This is for any projective variety. So algebraically hyperbolic varieties are groupless, and Brody hyperbolic projective varieties are actually algebraically hyperbolic. So Brody hyperbolic is in some sense the strongest, then you have algebraically hyperbolic, and then you have groupless. But if you believe Lang's conjecture, then groupless and Brody hyperbolic should be the same, so everything in between should also be the same. So the conjecture of Demaye, which is a consequence of Lang's optimistic conjecture, is that for projective varieties, Uh, everything should be equivalent. Being Brody, being algebraically hyperbolic, and being arithmetically hyperbolic. And here I assume k equals the complex numbers uh, implicitly. And all of this should be the same as being groupless. So the second piece of evidence is a algebraic analog of the following analytic statement, which is essentially due to Kobayashi and Brody and the same people I mentioned before. So the statement is that if you take a projective Brody hyperbolic variety over C, uh, then for every other projective variety over C, you can look at the moduli space of maps from this variety to X, and this is a projective scheme itself.
and it in fact inherits the Brody hyperbolicity. So it's a projective Brody hyperbolic scheme over C. I, here I say scheme because it might be non-reduced a priori. But more, moreover, it's not just that this space is bounded, it's not just a projective space. Once you start looking at maps between varieties in, uh, which are pointed, then these spaces become uh, zero dimensional. So for every B that is non-empty and reduced inside Y, and for every A that is non-empty and closed and reduced, the set of morphisms that sent B onto A is finite. So to simplify the exposition, I'm gonna focus on the in particular that are right now. So in particular, the subjective maps from Y to X, uh, that set is finite, and now I remember this is due to Noguchi as well. This last part. So in particular, the, the set of subjective maps from y to x is finite. Okay, so if you believe Lang de Maillet's conjecture, then I should be able to erase Brody hyperbolic and write algebraically hyperbolic everywhere. And so this is uh, the result. So maybe I just erase it. <laughs> Otherwise I have to write it all again. So the second piece of evidence, which is uh, joined with Ludmila Kamenova, is that if X is a projective algebraically hyperbolic variety over K, then for any projective variety over K, the space of maps from Y to X is a projective algebraically hyperbolic scheme. So it's again bounded and it inherits the algebraic hyperbolicity. And at the same time, the set of maps from y to x, which sent a fixed non-empty set onto another fixed non-empty set is finite, and in particular, the subjective maps from y to x form a finite set. You were previously done about just the automorphism group, right? Exactly, which is implied by, yeah. Yeah, so in particular, also the automorphism group of x is finite. In the proof, do you use technique? What technique? In the proof of that Yes? Uh, P-adic techniques? No. no. No, I just use algebraic, uh, just algebraic geometry. Because, uh, in fact, this is enough, in some sense. You proved, so algebraic hyperbolicity. Yeah. Ah, you use uh, P-adic. Yes, I use no P-adic. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, I, I will mention in the end a slight generalization of, of this theorem. Because, uh, but before we get to that, let me, let me mention one other piece of evidence. So this is a little intermezzo about a third piece of evidence. And then we go back to this, yeah? So I'd like to prove this uh, proof in a minute. But I'll only focus on this last part. So I'll only prove this last part. So what is the third topic that I want to talk about? If you take a groupless variety, say, over a field K, and you make K bigger, and you base change X to this bigger field, is it still groupless? And the answer is yes. So if I now look at what I call the persistence of grouplessness, this is quite simple to see that if this is an extension of algebraic closed fields of characteristic zero, and X is groupless over the small field, then this is the same as being groupless over the bigger field. This is a standard specialization spreading out argument. But if you believe Lang's conjectures, then this should also be true for algebraic hyperbolicity, and it is. 
it's not so easy and not so difficult to prove <laughs> that if you're algebraically hyperbolic over k, then this is the same as being algebraically hyperbolic over a field extension. And the only non-trivial thing to check is that there are curves here with maps to XL, which are not curves that can be defined over K. So you just have to specialize them in a uh, controllable manner. And so what I want to mention now is actually that for arithmetic hyperbolicity, we do not know this at the moment. We do not know that if you're arithmetically hyperbolic over Q bar, that you're then arithmetically hyperbolic over the complex numbers. Unless we start mixing notions of hyperbolicity. So the theorem that I would like to present as the third piece of evidence is that if x is a projective algebraically hyperbolic variety over k, then the arithmetic hyperbolicity of x and xl is equivalent. Persistence of arithmetic hyperbolicity is not known in general, but it is known if you add an additional boundedness assumption. And one can actually assume something much weaker, is namely what I call mildly bounded. And for the definition of that, I like you just look at my paper if you want to. <laughs> so let me now talk about the Green Griffiths Lang conjecture, and that's what I will finish with. Come on. So your minute is finished on the proof of that? No, oh, <laughs> I'll write it again, I'll write it again. So, so, so actually, <laughs> the fourth piece of evidence will imply also the third one, or the second one. And actually, the thing is, I've been talking about hyperbolic varieties. <laughs> But in reality, the correct notion to study is that of pseudo-hyperbolic varieties. And this is already clear from Green Griffiths's Lang conjecture. Namely, if you take a general type, if you take a projective variety over the complex numbers, then the property of being of general type is not equivalent to being Brody hyperbolic, it is equivalent to being pseudo-Brody hyperbolic. which is that there is a exceptional set for all entire curves, meaning there is a closed proper subset such that every holomorphic map, which is non-constant, uh, factors over delta. Every entire curve is contained in delta. This is what the Green Griffiths Lang conjecture says and it implies the, it doesn't imply it, but okay. <laughs> so, what I would like to propose is actually an extension of this uh, in the direction of the Maïs theorem, uh, which is uh, still written here. If you're algebraically, if you're Brody hyperbolic, then you're algebraically hyperbolic. So, it might be uh, reasonable to suspect that this is actually also the same. as being pseudo-algebraically hyperbolic. <laughs> so what does this mean? This means that there is a delta inside x, there is an exceptional locus, such that the same holds, such that for every curve, and for every morphism, from this curve to x, which doesn't factor over delta, the inequality holds. 
So I was a bit briefer. I should have said there exists a delta and there exists an ample line bundle and there exists a real number alpha. Uh, but let me just say it like this, okay? So it's the same definition, but I don't look at all maps from C to X. I look at those that don't land inside delta. They could still touch delta. <laughs> so fun fact, pseudo-algebraic hypervelocity, like general type, actually persists over field extensions. So here, for a projective variety <laughs> over k, if you're pseudo-algebraically hyperbolic over k, then you remain pseudo-algebraically hyperbolic over L. And the same holds for general type. Now, general type varieties by the theorem of Kobayashi Ochiai satisfy the finiteness theorem that I'm interested in. So we look at general type varieties and we notice that Kobayashi and Uchiai prove that if X is of general type, right, then the set of subjective maps from Y to X is finite. And now it gets a little bit interesting, because if you believe the conjecture, then you could, should be able to replace GT, which is general type, by either pseudo-algebraically hyperbolic or pseudo-Brody. And I will state that this, I will state the, the result, which is that if it's pseudo-algebraically hyperbolic, then we have, and we can prove this finiteness, but I don't know how to prove it if it's pseudo-Brody hyperbolic. So assuming an algebraic condition, I can prove the finiteness condition, but Assuming an analytic condition, I cannot. So if X is a pseudo-algebraically hyperbolic variety, which is projective over K, then for every other projective variety over K, the set of subjective maps is finite. So this is in accordance with that result and this conjecture. So now I will explain the proof of this, which is clearly slightly more general than what I stated before about just algebraically hyperbolic varieties. I have 15 more minutes? Yes, you have. Okay. <coughs> All right, so let me uh, recall how we proved the fact that Brody hyperbolic varieties have finely many automorphisms. We showed that this moduli space is compact and discrete, which is what we're gonna do here as well. We're not gonna show that it's compact, we're gonna show simply that it's bounded, that it's a finite type scheme. So step one is to say that without loss of generality, K is uncountable. 
And here, if k is already uncountable, there's no problem. If k is countable, I go to an uncountable field and I say, oh, by the persistence of pseudo-algebraic hyperbolicity, it remains pseudo-algebraically hyperbolic over this field extension. So I'm allowed to make my field bigger. Once it's un uncountable, I can start using Bertini-type cutting arguments. So step two is now that it's uncountable, I can show that for any other variety, which is projective, the moduli space of maps from y to x might not be finite type, but if I remove those that land inside delta, then this is a finite type. So here, delta is as in the definition. So this is an exceptional set for algebraic hyperbolicity in this case. So now that this is a finite type, well, the surjective maps from y to x are inside of here because surjective maps from y to x, they don't land inside delta because delta has a proper closed subset. So now that I have a moduli space, which is a finite type scheme, to show that it's finite, I have to show it's zero dimensional. Showing that a moduli space is zero dimensional is equivalent to showing that the objects it parametrizes are rigid. Exactly, yeah. So to show, to complete the proof, I have to show that every connected component of this moduli space is zero dimensional. So if F is a subjective map, then the connected component of this moduli space is zero dimensional. It's trivial. That's what I want to show. So now I look at uh, the subjective map and I apply a theorem of Huang, <coughs> Kabakus, and Peternell. The following theorem. This theorem is very general, and it's a statement, it's a theorem about subjective maps between normal projective varieties where the target is not uniruled. So essentially Kodari dimension not negative. So let me write the full theorem. Let F be a subjective morphism. <laughs> of say normal projective varieties. and assume x is not uni root. For instance, assume x is pseudo-algebraically hyperbolic. Then the statement is, in words, every infinitesimal deformation of f comes essentially from an infinitesimal deformation of an automorphism of y. It's not completely correct, it's up to a finite cover of x. So the statement is then, there exists a finite morphism there exists a morphism from y to z uh, such that 
F is this morphism. With the additional property that the automorphism group scheme of Z, the connected component of that, dominates the connected component of the moduli space sur Fyx. Okay, so I'll write it down such that. Oh. So there is a finite morphism, there is a morphism from y to z, such that f factorizes over the z, with the additional property uh, that there is a surjective map from this algebraic group onto this moduli space. I should say, actually, the theorem says more. It says that this is an isomorphism if you mod out the obvious kernel. But this is all I will use now. It's, I think it's the simplest way of phrasing it. Why is this simple? Uh, why, why, why am I done now? Because if x, now I go back to my proof. If x is pseudo-algebraically hyperbolic, then any finite cover of x is still pseudo-algebraically hyperbolic. In some sense, it's even closer to being algebraically hyperbolic. Now, I mentioned before, groupless varieties have a discrete automorphism group. But pseudo-algebraically hyperbolic varieties are pseudo-groupless, and they still have a discrete automorphism group. So this implies that odd z is trivial. And if this is trivial, then everything that dominates is also trivial. So this implies that this connected component is trivial. And this concludes the proof. OK, so that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. So when you define this uh, uh, algebraically, arithmetically hyperbolic, it makes sense also in positive characteristic, right? Um, well, if you take, say, an algebraic variety over k, which is now a field of characteristic p, then you could say it's arithmetically hyperbolic if for every finely generated subring or FP algebra of this k, the set of uh, points is finite. But then you'll probably run into problems with proving that curves of genus at least two are there is, hyperbolic. There is more there for, at least you can, you can restrict you for uh, yeah, but if, functional if you, field of curves, and then there is this uh, Samuel then, version of Mordell conjecture, right? Yeah, but if it's non-isotrivial, I think. Yeah. yeah, so you have to take a variety over k, a function field, say, over FP bar. Still, but the concept makes sense, right? Because yeah, yeah. I think algebraically hyperbolic collapses when we go mod P because of Frobenius, right? Exactly, yes. But what you could try to do is you could say, look at the definition of algebraically hyperbolic and take into account the Frobenius. So don't say for every morphism F, the degree is bounded. <coughs> say the degree is bounded by the genus times a constant times the degree of inseparability of the morphism in some sense. Mm -hmm. This is also what happens in uh, Shafarevich's conjecture over function fields for families of curves in characteristic P. The Arakelov inequality is a bound on the height where the degree of the inseparability of the family also plays a role. Yeah, so algebraic hyperbolicity, the, yeah, you could probably think about that in characteristic P if you take into account for Benius. Why haven't you done so? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I need some work for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Okay, if not, so thanks, Alien, again. Thank you.